Matthew chapter 11, reading from verse 1. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let him hear. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The son of man came, eating and drinking, and they say he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds." Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. And moving on to verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So reads the word of the Lord. And we're going to have a look at some very well-known and well-loved verses. That's 28 to 30, although I can't cover all three of them, but we'll have a a, a general look at them. But I would just say, never forget about verse 27. An extraordinary verse, uh, and I wish I could have the time to say a few things on that particular verse, but don't forget verse 27, uh, because we tend to. We tend to just concentrate on 28 to 30, which we're going to do this morning. But please don't forget about verse 27. Verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
And all I'm going to do this morning is to remind you of what you probably already know. Uh, and by the way, much of the New Testament was written simply as a reminder to the readers of what they already knew. For instance, Peter says in 2 Peter, I have written both letters, that's 1 Peter and 2 Peter, I have written both letters as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. So that's pretty much all I'm going to do this morning, is just to remind you. Now, why do we need reminding? <laughs> it's obvious, isn't it? Because we forget. And it's good to be reminded. So, our verses. So, first of all, let's have a look here at a specific invitation that the Lord Jesus gives. When he says those three wonderful words, come to me. And Jesus said pretty much something similar to the disciples when he first called them. Do you remember how he said, come, follow me? And the emphasis that I want to place is on the word me. Come to me. Because Jesus Christ does not say go, but he says come. He doesn't say go to somebody else, but he says come to me. Which really shows us that this is a, an offer of a friend. This is somebody that we can draw near to and who wants to fellowship with us, to have some kind of relationship with us. Come to me. He does not send us to somebody else. I, I, I'm sure we've all been to our GP. But generally, our GP, after they have spoken to us, often very sympathetically, they send us to somebody else, don't they? And so when I a while back went because I had hurt my tennis elbow, uh, the doctor, the GP, very sympathetically counseled me and talked to me about it, but then he sent me to the physio. Or if you go to the doctor and you maybe have a skin condition, they will send you to the dermatologist, to somebody else who can help you. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ never does that. He never sends us to somebody else because he knows very well that there is no one better to deal with the issues that we have in our lives. So he will never say go, but he will always say come. Come to me. Because there is nobody more able to understand us and our difficulties. Nobody more able to help us and to heal us and to forgive us and to restore us. He is better than our spouse. He is better than our parents. He is better than our pastor. He is better than our GP. And he knows that. Which is why he says, come to me. And so whatever our need is here this morning, and I suspect in a congregation this size, there are many needs. Some pretty serious, pretty deep, pretty urgent. And so therefore, we must hear this invitation that the Lord Jesus Christ gives to us. Come to me in faith, trusting and hoping and knowing. Remembering, of course, who he is. And that's half our problem. One of the reasons why Jesus is not always our first port of call is because we forget who he is. That he is the great I am. That he is the son of God, our saviour and redeemer. He is our prophet, priest and king. He is our advocate and our physician. I, I found this uh, fairly recently and I liked it and I'm going to pass it on to you. To the artist, Jesus is the one altogether lovely. To the architect, he is the chief cornerstone. To the baker, he is the living bread. To the banker, he is the hidden treasure. To the biologist, he is the life. To the builder, he is the sure foundation. To the doctor, he is the great physician. To the educator, he is the great teacher. To the farmer, he is the lord of the harvest. To the florist, he is the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. To the geologist, he is the rock of ages. To the jurist, he is the righteous judge and the judge of all men. To the jeweller, he is the pearl of great price. To the lawyer, he is the counsellor and the lawgiver and advocate. To the horticulturist, he is the true vine. To the newspaper man, he is the good tidings of great joy. 
To the oculist, he is the light of the world. To the philanthropist, he is the unspeakable gift. To the philosopher, he is the wisdom of God. To the preacher, he is the word of God. To the sculptor, he is the living stone. To the servant, he is the good master. To the statesman, he is the desire of all nations. To the student, he is the incarnate truth. To the theologian, he is the author and finisher of our faith. To the traveler, he is the new and living way. To the toiler, he is the giver of rest. To the sinner... He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And to the Christian, he is the Son of the living God, my Savior, my Redeemer, my Lord. And when we know the Lord Jesus Christ, something like that, then we will take up his invitation when he says, come to me. Because I am sufficient, I am adequate to be able to meet your needs. He is the one who is able to sympathize us. He is the one who is able to strengthen us and equip us like no one else. And therefore we approach him with the knowledge and the confidence, knowledge of his love for us and confidence of his acceptance, believing, believing that he is able to help us whatever our need might be, however deep, however urgent, however much it keeps us awake at night. Jesus Christ is able to deal with that. So we run to him just as a little child runs to his mother, knowing that his mother loves him and will accept him and will help him. Come to me, says Jesus. Now in these verses we have three encouragements, if you like, motivations, incentives to do just that. To go to Jesus. And here's the first in verse 29 where Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle. That's the first motivation. Come to me because I am gentle. Do you know what that means? That means that there's no need to be afraid of him. That he's not severe or hard or aggressive or uncaring. So much of the world is. But Jesus Christ is gentle. He will not condemn us or thrust us away. And if you don't believe me, just read about how he dealt with people who came to him in the four Gospels. The tenderness that he showed. Let me just give you one example. Do you remember that woman who was caught in adultery? She was caught in adultery. Somebody has obviously been either spying on her or she couldn't care less and so she had committed adultery fairly openly. She wasn't trying to hide it. But not only was she ruining her own marriage, but she was ruining somebody else's marriage. I wonder whether there were children involved. I don't know whether there is anybody here who has been a a child and parents have split because one of them had committed adultery. It causes pain, doesn't it? It causes heartache. So here is this woman ruining people's lives. And under the law, she should have been stoned and that's what everybody else wanted, didn't they? They wanted to stone her to death, give her what she deserves for what she has done. And we know what Jesus does. He just says nothing to start with and just writes something in the sand. I wish I knew what he wrote, but I don't. And then he says those amazing words that he who is without sin, throw the first stone. And they all gradually started to leave from the oldest to the youngest. And then Jesus turns to this woman and very gently says to her, Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she says. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. But it's the gentleness with which she says that. There's no waving a big stick over her. There's no threat of punishment that God is going to zap you because of what you've done. It's the gentleness of how he deals with with her sin. Now we don't know what happened to that lady but I can almost imagine when somebody deals with you so graciously that is such an encouragement to turn from your sin and to live a life that is pleasing to God. Gentle in the way he deals so kind and considerate in his manner especially to the hurting. 
I can guarantee you that if you are hurting here this morning and you go to Jesus, he will deal with you gently. I remember when one of our cats was, she was dying and she was obviously in quite a bit of pain and discomfort and we had to take her to the vet and she was probably going to have her life ended. But I remember as gently as I possibly could, and I don't think I have ever done anything so gently, I just picked her up so very carefully to place her in her basket so that we could put her in the car and take her to the vet. It's gentleness. Do you remember how Paul appealed to the Corinthians? He says, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. So that's the first incentive that we're giving about coming to Jesus. Here's the second in verse 29 again. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Jesus is humble. He's, he's lowly. He does not have a, a high and mighty attitude, although he is high and mighty. He does not look down upon us as inferior, although he is the exalted one, and we are inferior. We are like grasshoppers in his sight, we are told in the scriptures. There is nothing brash or arrogant about Christ. And when we know the gentleness and the humility of Christ, when we know something of his character, what does it do? It gives us reason enough to go to him. Whatever our problems, whatever our difficulties, whatever pain is being caused in our lives. Here's the third motivation in verse 28. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Just imagine if it read like this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I might give you rest. It wouldn't mean the same, would it? Might suggests uncertainty. There's doubt there. But the Lord Jesus Christ says, if you come to me, I will give you rest. Now, what happens if we go to our GP, who is a very gentle man or woman, very humble man or woman, but they are not able to help us? Well, all very nice to have a nice chat with them but they're not able to help us so it doesn't actually do us much good Jesus Christ is able to meet our needs because he is the omnipotent one his power is infinite and unlimited he has the ability to bring relief to take away that weariness those burdens that are weighing us down and causing us so much stress and concern he is able to bring rest to the troubled soul, peace to a stricken conscience. And boy, oh boy, our consciences are sometimes stricken, aren't they? But Jesus Christ is able to bring peace. He's able to lift that fear and anxiety that maybe we've been suffering under for weeks. He's able to give assurance of salvation. And boy, oh boy, there are so many Christians who need that assurance of salvation. That they are the Lord's and he will not let them go. He is able to meet our needs. That is why we go to him. Do you remember Elijah in the Old Testament? When he was sent away and God sent ravens. Can you believe that? God sent ravens to feed him every morning and every evening with bread and meat. Ravens are meat-eating birds. And yet God sent ravens to feed Elijah while he was by the brook from which he could drink. It's a non-biblical example. Let me tell you about David Brainerd, who you probably know. He was a missionary to the American Indians. And one day he was caught in a, a terrible storm and he found shelter in the hollow log of a very large tree. And while he was there, he prayed for the Indians and he prayed for his own needs. But there was no food and he was very hungry. And as he was there sheltering in the log, he suddenly noticed a squirrel approaching. And leaving very close to him a little pile of nuts that it had gathered. Well, David Brainerd was very thankful and ate the nuts. 
For three days the storm raged, and each day the squirrel came with a little pile of nuts and deposited them for the hungry missionary to eat. David Brainard was convinced that God had sent the squirrel to meet his needs. <laughs> Isn't God very imaginative in the way that he meets our needs and the way that he helps us? He sometimes does the unexpected. Jesus Christ is able to meet our needs, whether it be for food like David Brainerd, whether it's for peace or rest or whatever. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. No doubt, no uncertainty. I will give you rest from anxiety, from fear. That he is able to meet the needs that we have and to give refreshment. And you know, that's what rest really means. It's refreshment. And I really learned what that word refreshment meant some years ago. We went to Corsica on holiday and Pauline and I, we walked a little bit along the route called the GR20. I don't know whether you've ever walked that route, but it is an extremely difficult route. We only did a little bit of it. It goes from the northwest of the island to the southeast of the island. It's approximately 124 miles long and at an average altitude of 1,000 to 2,000 meters. And some of the route is so difficult that it's fitted with fixed ladders and chains and cables. And they actually say to do the route, you need some mountaineering experience. And they say that you should only do it if you are in good physical condition. So it's not a Sunday afternoon stroll. It's a very difficult walk. And Pauline and I, we only did a little bit of it. I'm not boasting here that we did the whole lot. We only did a little bit of it. But boy, oh boy, it was difficult. We hadn't taken enough water with us. And so by the time we finished, we were not only exhausted, but we were very thirsty. And as soon as we returned to our car, we drove as quickly as we could to the nearest supermarket. We bought one of those two-liter carton cartons of fresh orange juice. And before we had even left the supermarket, we sat down and we drank the lot together. And I understood the meaning of refreshment. So tired, so thirsty. Oh, I have never tasted orange juice like it. And we left that supermarket refreshed. That's what Jesus Christ does. That's what rest means. It means refreshment. Because he is our gentle, humble provider. So we have a specific invitation here. Come to me and we are given incentives to do just that. But then the second thing I want to say is that we have a specific invitation to a specific group of people. And they are, as you see in verse 28, the weary and burdened. The fatigued. The downcast. The depressed. Now let me split that up into through three different groups of people. Here are the first. Those who are wearied and burdened by sin. The trouble with sin is it brings guilt with it. And guilt does not make you happy. Sin brings pollution. It brings condemnation. It brings a sense of shame and fear. We've all experienced that, haven't we? You know what I'm talking about. And we beca can become loaded down by sin. Because I tell you, sin is a hard taskmaster. It's a cruel tyrant. The more we sin, the heavier and heavier we get in our spirit. It's as if it adds one stone at a time. A bit like the Egyptians when they cried, bricks without straw. It makes life hard. Sin hardens us. It entangles us. And it can sometimes cause us to fall flat on our face. I read quite an amusing story just the other day as I was preparing this. Yesterday, I think it was. And I thought, oh, I must share this. But it does have a point to it. I read about a thief 
who grabbed some sausages in a meat market, but to his shock, they were part of a string 45 feet long. And as he ran away, he became entangled, so entangled in these sausages that he fell to the ground. And the more he struggled, the more he became entangled until he was arrested by the police. Now my point is that sin does just that. It entangles us, trips us up, and calls us, causes us to fall flat on our face. Burdened by sin. We all know what that means. Burdened by sin. In fact, the reason why we are Christians is we were so burdened by sin that we needed, desperately needed relief and release from it, which is why we went to Jesus Christ to receive that. We all know that about the burden of sin. Billy Sunday, who was the American evangelist, wrote a letter to the mayor of a large city where he was going to start various meetings, asking for the names of those who had spiritual problems and who needed help and prayer. And to his surprise, although he shouldn't have been surprised, but he was, to his surprise, he received from the mayor the city directory with everybody's name in it. Because we know about the burden of sin. We've experienced it. We are sometimes wearied and burdened by it. There's a story about Noel Coward, who is the English playwright. He sent identical notes to 20 of the most prominent men in London. And this is what the note said. All is discovered. Escape while you can. Now the interesting thing is, is that apparently all 20 left the city immediately. Because we know what it is to be burdened by sin. We have those skeletons in our cupboard. We are doing things, even today we may have done them, we are doing things that we know are wrong in the sight of God. We know that it does not bring happiness, but it weighs us down. It burdens us. What does Jesus say to us? He says, come to me. All you who are burdened and wearied and I will give you rest. Do you realize there is nowhere else in the world where your sin can be dealt with except at the feet of Jesus? Try a hundred thousand other places. It will not be dealt with. But if you come to Jesus Christ, he will wash it away and make you clean. Can I just ask you this very important question? What sin is Jesus unable to forgive? Now I know some smart aleck will say, ah, oh, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, if you're worried about that, you haven't committed it. But just flick over a few pages, would you, to Matthew and chapter 15, and we just get one of many lists of sins that we have in the Bible. But this is Jesus speaking in Matthew 15 and verse 19, where Jesus says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean. Now, let me just ask you, which one of those sins... Can Jesus not forgive? Is he able to forgive evil thoughts that we have? And I tell you this much, we all have them, don't we? But is he able to forgive them? Of course he is. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. What about adultery? You say, oh, I don't commit adultery. Don't you ever lust? But Jesus Christ is able to forgive us when we repent. What about murder? Oh, I've never murdered anybody. Oh, but boy, oh boy, you've hated a few, haven't we? We would have liked to have seen <laughs> a few murdered in our time. There is no sin that Jesus Christ cannot forgive. Slander. We thank God for the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. He is able to forgive all who repent. That is why, I don't know whether you sing it here, but I remember in the olden days we used to sing that song, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. 
Oh yes, power to wash us clean. One of the reasons I'm saying this is that there are some Christians who suffer under a false guilt for years. They are tormented by the devil for something they have done, something sinful that they have done in the past, but which has been forgiven and washed away by the blood of Christ. And yet the evil one keeps coming, keeps reminding them, keeps causing them of suffering because of the guilt that they feel from what they've done. Oh, my friend, Jesus Christ can wash the dirtiest person clean and make them whole before a living God. He does not turn away a humble penitent, the weary and the burdened. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. That's the first group, those who are burdened and wearied by sin. Here's the second group, those wearied and burdened by rules and regulations. Those who live as if they are under the teachings of the Pharisees, who tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders. Those oppressed by having to reach a standard in order, in their own mind, to be acceptable to God. Those who are trying to fulfill all sorts of religious obligations in order to win favour. And they are weary from the toil. Those who are trying to climb into heaven by their own efforts and building their towers of Babel so high that they hope they'll be able to climb in by their own ability. Beware that we do not turn our Christian lives into a list of do's and don'ts. The Christian life is about life. It's about freedom. Oh, I'm not talking about freedom to sin. Surely you realize that. But I would say that Christian life is a life about freedom. It's not simply a list of can't do that, can do that, can't do that, can do that. Because the sad thing is, I have known Christians who live their lives with a list of do's and don'ts. Jesus Christ has not brought us into true life and liberty to live like that. You see, salvation by works, which is basically what it is, always leads to despair and hopelessness and wretchedness. Why is that? Because we cannot do it. We can never make ourselves acceptable to God. Because we groan under the law and its penalty. We know very well that we fail and fall short. And we end up broken in the dust. We've got nowhere to go. We have no hope left. We tried and tried and tried. But we cannot make it. Jesus is calling to us, come to me. Because he has fulfilled the law and the prophets on our behalf. He is our righteousness. We are justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And when we turn to him in repentance and faith, we are declared righteous on the basis of Christ's perfect righteousness. And I can tell you this, you can get no better than that. And that means our guilt is gone. And our sins have been forgiven. So beware. If you are this morning burdened by rules and regulations. Either that other people have imposed upon us. Or you have imposed upon yourself. Jesus will give you rest. Because he is all we need. And finally. The third group. Those wearied and burdened. By the trials and stresses of life. There's a Malay proverb which reads, From the jaws of the crocodile into the teeth of the tiger. And sometimes life feels like that, doesn't it? We've just managed to escape from the jaws of the crocodile, and now we're in the teeth of a tiger. There's so much trouble. Not only in the world out there, not only in a place like Ukraine, terrible though that is, there is so much trouble 
add pressure in our own lives. Problems arise, don't they, on a, a daily basis, that there are worries here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> Somebody said that worry is like a rocking chair. It will give you something to do, but it won't get you anywhere. <laughs> Did you know, actually, that the word worry is derived from an old Anglo-Saxon word meaning, listen to this, to strangle or to choke. And doesn't worry do just that? It chokes our hope, it chokes our life, it chokes our happiness. It kind of strangles us. I think Robert Frost was right when he says the reason why worry kills more people than work is that more people worry than work. <laughs> but have you noticed today that everybody's in such a hurry? Everybody seems to be in such a hurry. So much to do. And sadly, even the church can be a place of stress, anxiety, and tribulation. The number of pastors that I have come across that have resigned because of stress within the church. A dear friend of mine, she's not a pastor but she worked in a church, she has recently resigned her position because there were so many difficulties, there was so much work, there was so lack of, lack of understanding and sympathy within the workplace, the atmosphere within the church was so bad she couldn't take it any longer, she resigned her position and has got a job elsewhere. You know, in the 21st century, with all the technology that we enjoy, the scientific knowledge, the medical advances, we are more weary and burdened than ever before, it seems to me. And we desperately need rest. Why is euthanasia becoming more popular? Why are suicide rates so high? Because people are tired of life. They're finding life too hard. And it can be hard. The stresses and strains and worries of life. Well, what do we do with all this trouble that can come upon us so unexpectedly? What do we do? Come to me, says Jesus. All you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Can I leave you with these words? Lay down your burdens. Whatever they are. Lay down your burdens at the feet of Jesus. Rest in his arms, trust in his love, and be absolutely certain of his sovereign power. When trials come and storms arise, when tempests darken earth and skies, and everything my spirit tries, I'll hide myself in Jesus. When friends turn cold and scorn to own that I as friend was ever known and I am left all alone, I'll hide myself in Jesus. Should fortune fail and sorrows come and I am left without a home, I know in Christ there's always room to hide myself in Jesus. Should that dear one on whom I lean no longer by my side be seen, should death's dark veil e'er come between, I'll hide myself in Jesus. There is no other safe retreat where I may hide when tempests beat. Here I have found a rest complete while hiding now in Jesus. Oh, let me always here abide, safe sheltered in his wounded side, till I the storms of earth outride. Till then, I'll hide in Jesus. Let's pray together.
Oh gracious God, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for the words that not only he said, but the words that have been recorded for us. Thank you, Father, for this reminder this morning that whatever our situation in life, however weary and burdened we are, and for whatever reason, thank you that we can freely come to the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, we would not just hear this word and walk out the door and do nothing about it, but I pray, help us all to go to Jesus and to lay our burdens at, our, at his feet. And we know that you are a God whose promises are true and reliable and that we will receive the rest that we crave. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.